Dr. Richard Wolf is with us, economist and professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, author of numerous books, his latest Democracy at Work, the website democracyatwork.info. And uh, Professor Wolf, you also have a, a, a website of your own, right? I certainly do. And it it's is? rdwolf with two Fs dot com. Real simple. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I wanted to get into this. I, I'm guessing that you saw the... Um, the article in the New York Times over the weekend that said that asset prices are an all-time high, and uh, the the many articles that have populated the Financial Times over the last few months, warning about asset bubbles and also warning about uh, you know the overfinancialization of our economy that everything is like starting to wobble, and uh, it seems to me that nobody is really seriously talking about. Like what FDR did, for example, uh, you know, when he when all these people had underwater mortgages, nobody's seriously talking about increasing demand by putting money into working people's hands, by you know fixing the mortgage crisis, fixing the unemployment crisis, raising wages, those kind of things. I, let me just toss that to you, and you can go off on it. Well, I think that that you're right, but I think there's a kind of almost biblical uh, process working its way out here, a kind of chickens coming home to roost. Here's what we have. Over the last 30 years, and particularly since the crisis, we have, as everyone knows, widened the gap between rich and poor. We did it through automation, we did it through the way capital accumulates, and we did it particularly by moving jobs from Western Europe, North America, and Japan to China, India, Brazil, and so on, where corporations could pay much lower wages. The end result of all of that is masses of people's wages haven't gone up. Those in the old developed parts of the world have seen their wages stagnate at best, and those in the new parts of the world that are developing are, of course, paid much, much less than those in the old. Bottom line, the mass of people don't have the incomes they once had and can't buy a lot of stuff, and that's part of our crisis. The government reacts by pumping vast amounts of money into the economy and then seems to be surprised when that money doesn't have the intended and hoped for result. It doesn't lead to more production. It doesn't need a lead to hiring more workers to produce more goods precisely because the mass of people can't buy those goods. So what do the people do with all the money pouring into the banks? They speculate in the stock market. They bid up the prices of real estate. They pay outrageous amounts for art objects. All of those assets being bid up, and so you have the article, there's a bubble, and so the great fear, which is correct, is that eventually you're going to bid up prices to the point where it can't be sustained, and we're going to have the kind of meltdown again that we had in 2008. Or could it even be worse? Could this be the Dutch tulip bulbs of our era? Could this be the South Sea? We never know in advance when these things exactly happen, and we never know, it's sort of like a chain reaction, how far it will go, how many parts of the world economy it will suck into its vortex. Uh, but if the last one, the 2008 one, is any indication, we get there as close to the abyss of economic meltdown uh, as we have been at least since the Great Depression. And in some ways, it's even worse because it's a, a globalized uh, economy. Well, and that, we permit, and that, that's, yeah, an, that's an important point that I wanted to ask you about. In 1929, when our economy crashed, we had had nine years since the election of Warren Harding, who dropped the, that top 93% tax rate down to 25% when he first came into office, who uh, campaigned on a, on a platform of uh, less government business, more business in government, in other words, privatization and cutting regulations, massively cut regulations, particularly on banks. Um, it, 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 we basically had had nine years of Reaganomics and it crashed the America, but it had not infected much of the rest of the world. In fact, you even had countries that, you know, the Soviet Union was beginning to form and I, you know, other things like that. Now, uh, you know, in, in 78, we had, you had Maggie Thatcher and in 80, you had Reagan and the UK and the United States started following this bizarre economic theory that came out of the Chicago School and von Mises and, and Friedman and all these guys. And it has been adopted by so much of the world 
And in Russia, you know, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Russia invited the Chicago school boys in, and they said, oh, yeah, just privatize everything. And now they've got an oligarch problem, much as we do here in the United States as a result of Reaganomics. Um, a, please correct me if I've got any of that wrong. And B, does this worldwide contagion of this economic insanity mean that we're at much greater risk for a worldwide disaster than the world experienced in the early 30s? The risk is absolutely, uh, you're absolutely right. The risk is there. The risk is enormous. I'll give you a couple very quick uh, statistics to give you an idea. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, the average level of debt of an American household was 30% of their annual income. In other words, the household together owed 30% as much money as they earned in one year. In, in 2007, when the current crisis hit, the level of debt of the average American household was 130% of its annual income. Wow. In other words, we can't figure out because we have no historical model for what a crisis means and how long it will last and how deep it will cut when you have that level of debt overhang. And indeed, one of the reasons we're, we're lasting so long that this crisis, which wasn't even supposed to happen, has lingered on and continued the way it has both in Europe and Japan and on this side of the world is because of that debt overhang. When you add to that what you correctly pointed to, was, which is the ideology that governs what governments think they ought to do and can do, and the privatization fetish that they all espouse, you can see a kind of inability to grapple with the problem, a commitment to wait it out, to kind of wait till this situation, quote unquote, heals itself. And here we are, seven years plus into this crisis, still waiting for the healing, uh, which is happening neither in Japan nor Europe, on the one hand, and not really here either, if you understand the statistics coming out each month. And that waited out, let it heal itself, that was Herbert Hoover's solution. Absolutely. It's been the preferred solution of the business community and the wealthy. They are basically afraid that if you admit that your privatized capitalist economic system generates the kinds of crisis we now live through, and that the only solution is for the government to come in, which, by the way, had to be admitted in 2008 and 9, when the bankers themselves begged the government to come in and save them, then there's always the fear among the right-wingers and the business folks that the government as savior will begin to be looked upon by the mass of people in terms of all the other things it might do, from raising minimum wages to limiting the ability of companies to leave the country or evade their taxes in tax havens and all the rest. And fearing where this might go, they prefer wait it out. And of course, those who are rich are the ones who are least discomforted by waiting years. Well, in years, fact, their wealth is increasing. Else. While they're yes, waiting it out. That is, the, you know, for me, just between you and me and the lamppost, that for me is, in a sense, the most obscene dimension of all of this. After all, in the 1930s, because of what was done, the inequality in the United States was drastically reduced. It was the most dramatic equalization movement we've ever seen in our country's history. Unlike that now, the crisis worsens the very inequality that brought us. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. It's uh, how stupid we are being economically. Professor Richard Wolf, economist and professor of economics uh, emeritus at the University of Mass in Amherst, Democracy at Work. Info rdwolf.com. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity. Great talking. We'll be back.